You're listening to Sermon Cast Media from Antioch Community Church in Wichita, Kansas. For more of our sermons, resources, or to support this ministry financially, see our website at antiochwichita.org. All right, I'm going to uh, pick up the baton and continue running in the book of Titus. Um, So we'll be in Titus chapter 2 today. Uh, Pastor Randy opened us up with uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to sidestep the rest of the verses in um, chapter 1 and allow our elders and pastors to um, unpack that as the Lord leads them. And I'm going to pick up in chapter 2. As I was preparing for this message, I started to reflect on God's grace in my life. I started to reflect on how God called me out and called me in all at the same time. And so a couple weeks ago, you guys heard Pastor Randy's testimony of how he grew up in the church. However, my testimony is a little bit different because I grew up in the streets. And some of of us heard the old adage that you could take somebody out of the streets, but you can't take the streets out of them. And so that's been part of my testimony as I've been experiencing God's grace and God's goodness. As I got saved and and I just had a heart for God and, and, and a holy abandonment for God, I didn't understand what that really looked like. But I did know this, that I experienced some unmerited favor. I experienced something that I can't earn and I definitely don't deserve. And in our faith, we call that grace. I love how the modern psalmist puts it. They say that if grace was an ocean, we all be sinking. That's how good God is. And sometimes I take my enthusiasm about life and about sports and about just having a a memory to reflect on how God saved, protect, shielded me, and called me in as a, a son. And I just love to celebrate them. I love to celebrate them. And so one of the things I got to be very careful with um, in celebrating God is that I'm not overly led by my emotions and that truth can ground me and that truth can keep me sound and that truth can keep me sober. But... Psalms 139 declares that God put me together in my mother's womb. He gave me my emotions. And so as I am uniquely me and you are uniquely you, um, I want to encourage you this morning, give yourself permission to praise God. Right? Give yourself permission to celebrate God for who he is. There comes a point in all of our lives where we have to grow from celebrating God for what he does, or celebrating God for who he is. And what we're going to do today is we're going to unpack that. And we're going to figure out what does that look like um, as a community formed by grace. And so today I'm going to be unpacking a a couple ideas um, along this thought. Grace-informed discipleship. Let's pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' strong name for your word. Your word is perfect. Um, You say that when your word goes out, it accomplishes exactly what you sent it out to do. And so as your word goes out, I pray in Jesus' name for ears to be open, for minds to be uh, renewed, for hearts to be soft, so that the men and the women that you have called will live out their purpose and multiply your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. Paul is writing to uh, Titus. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in love, sound in faith, in love, impatient. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their, hus- obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God 
may not be blasphemy. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, uh, sound speech. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And so today we're going to look at three ideas. We're going to look um, at verses 1 through 10 and unpack these three ideas and categories. First, we're going to look at uh, grace informed discipleship promotes sound doctrine. Okay, so when you see that word sound, I want you to consider healthy, healthy doctrine. Okay, uh, second point we're going to look at today is grace informed discipleship produces authentic relationships. And then we're going to close our time together by looking at how grace-informed discipleship persuades sacrificial living. All right, so in Titus um, chapter 1, uh, the, ver- the scriptures aren't going to be up there, but a little context before we jump into chapter 2. Uh, Titus chapter 1, 12, the prophets of Crete say that the people of Crete are always liars, that they're evil beasts, and that they're lazy gluttons. Verse 10 says that uh, there's a whole bunch of people that's rebellious and that they're empty talkers and that they're deceivers and that they focus on legalism and they focus on circumcision. And so Paul is encouraging Titus to go in uh, with eyes wide open to know who he's dealing with and, and to be an example. He's telling Titus that in Crete there are some people that's caught up in Jewish myths and genealogies, and and, and I come from uh, Abraham's the father and Moses the father and all these other things, and nobody's talking about all hell King Jesus. And so uh, Paul is talking to Titus, and he's saying, "Watch out for the men that that turn away from the com- that turn away from the truth, and that they're full of empty talk." And then that brings us to Titus chapter one, verse sixteen, and this is what it says before we transition into chapter two, verse one. It says this about the people of Crete: they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualifiers of every good work. And so I think verse 16 gives us an accurate picture of what the people of Crete look like spiritually. However, if you know me, you know that we can't leave that in uh, A.D. 64, 65, and we have to be able to give the Holy Spirit permission to speak to us about how we look, how we live, how we take the gospel of grace for granted. And so as we unpack this idea of grace-informed discipleship that promotes sound doctrine, I want to look at verse 1. It says this, but as for you, Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now, reading that initially, it's easy to jump into, oh, man, I have to know all this doctrine. What does that word mean? And what, what, what is Paul telling Titus here? But he's not telling him only to know sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. He's telling him to speak the things that are proper. And so the, the, the New Living Translation breaks it down a little bit like this. It says, as for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. My question to you today is, what kind of teaching does your life promote? We all promote something. I know right now I'm kind of caught up in promoting my son, right? Oh, Azale, I love him. He just, he just, he thinks every day is his birthday, and we done sung happy birthday to him all week, and his birthday isn't until October, <laughs> right? Or we get caught up in promoting our job, or we get caught up in promoting our church, or we get caught up promoting our sports teams that we don't receive a paycheck for, or anything like that. We promote all 
these things. And so Jesus kind of paints a picture of what it looks like to promote the wrong things. And he breaks it down a little something like this in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 through 28. He says this, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness, uncleanliness. Um, even so, you are you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And then Paul kind of says the same thing, a little something like this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. He says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, uh, Boasters, proud, blasphemies, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then we're going to crescendo on verse five, having a form of godliness, but denying its power and from such people turn away. And so as we think about that last verse in verse five of having a form of godliness, but denying, the, denying his power and turning away from it, I want us to unpack this idea of waxed fruit. And give me my next slide. As you look at this next slide, please identify the real fruit on this slide. Please identify the real fruit. I know y'all got some. Uh, zoom on your camera, some bifocals, trifocals, something that you could zoom in on it with and, and see exactly where the real fruit is on that picture. And so as we think about this idea of wax fruit, fake fruit, um, Tony Evans says this. He says that people who have a form of godliness and denying his power is is a a is to project a religious appearance absent of true spiritual reality. And so I'm gonna slow that down, rebind it, bring it back, allow it to land home with you. Have you ever been in a situation where you project a religious appearance absence of true spirituality? Religion without the presence and power of God is like wax fruit. It looks good, but possesses no nutritional value. So Jesus said that you look good on the outsides. Church and religion is traditionally known for throw, put on your Sunday's best and get a haircut and shave and put on some musk, some aftershave, some brute, some whatever you wear. Amen. And come to church smelling good and looking good, but inside all hell's breaking loose and you are a hypocrite. And at home, you're not loving your wife. And at home, you're not loving your kids. And at work, you are not being the light. And at work, you are, are complaining. And at work, you're doing all these things. You look good on the outside, though. And then soon as somebody opens the door for you to minister to the gospel of grace. You come in talking about Jesus and it's not healthy because on the backside of everything you've been doing in your life, it doesn't reflect the goodness or the mercy of the Lord. And so what happens is unbelievers begin to turn their ears off and they don't want to be receptive to the free gift of salvation. And so as we grow in our grace-informed discipleship, God's plan is to move us from being whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones or having a form of ungodliness but denying the power of it to righteousness and live in a way that advances the gospel. Live in a way, I'm going to make this statement, and this might be kind of tough for some of y'all, and I don't mean anything offensive by it. It's just how I'm wired, and so I just got to speak how I speak. We need to live in a way 
that the gospel is sexy and attractive. And people could say, oh my God, what must I do to be saved? Not based on me, but based on who I follow. Because when I follow the master, I start looking like the master. I start talking like the master. I start smelling like the master. Have you ever looked up to anybody? I found myself five years ago going to a, a pastor's conference, and um, there was a, a younger pastor down there that just kind of blew me away. And as he was uh, talking and, and, and doing his thing, um, I, was, I was so blown away by him that I found myself talking like him as a grown man, right? And the Holy Spirit came in and convicted me and said, hold on, stop looking to men and look to me that way. And so when you spend enough time in the presence of God, we'll start walking in the power of God. But let me say this, our power comes from prayer. Our, prior, our power comes from proximity. Our power comes from having a relationship with the Lord. Paul's instructing Titus about the behavior. Um, that a dis So I'm sorry. So we're going to look at Titus chapter 2, verses 2 through 6, and then we're going to skip 7 and 8 and then jump down into 9 and 10 because they fit into my category and the way I think. And so uh, <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. All right. So in verse 2, uh, Paul's telling Titus, this is how older men should look. This is how older men that love Christ uh, should live. Verse 2 says that older men should be so sober, reverent, temperate, sound in love, I mean sound in faith, and in love, and in patience. My question to you is, do you know any older men that fit the opposite of each one of those things we just listed out, right? We all do, right? We all do because there's room to grow. Then he says this about older women. He says that older women, likewise, they are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers. And I'm kind of park real quick right there. And that's just basically mean that older women should... <laughs> Older women shouldn't be like the real house of, of, of the real housewives of Hollywood. Older women shouldn't be sitting up just spreading slander and gossip and talking about, uh, man, you should have seen Shaquika. Shaquika came to the party and them red pumps and, and she know that rig wasn't straight and I can't believe she wore that. And then Shaquika come through the door. Hey, girl. <laughs> That's what Titus is saying, that older women should not be like that. And we all know some Older women like that, we all got a little older women in us, and my hand is, is raised. Amen. Um, not giving to too much wine and teachers of good things. And, and as I was telling you at the beginning that I was raised in the streets, um, being raised in the streets, I've met a lot of older women that taught bad things. They taught bad things because they've been taught bad things, and that's all they knew was to, to get some quick money and, and, and how to uh, self-medicate and, and how to uh, medicate the kids when they being too loud or, or I got to do what I got to do and kids are waking up and there's no parents home because these older women are trying to put food on the plate because there's no dad in the house. Then he goes on, verses 4 and 5, and says this about the younger women. He said um, that they admonish, that they should admonish, older women should admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And then he says this in verse 6 about the young men. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. In verse 9, he says, exhort, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, um, and not showing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And so 
in a nutshell, we see here that Paul is informing Titus to go in and teach, um, teach leaders how to be leaders, whether they're uh, old or young and everything in between, whether they're male or female. And he's saying this is what they should look like. Think about that. If Paul is telling Titus this is what they should look like, there's a whole bunch of opposite behavior going on. And so in grace-informed discipleship that produces authentic relationships is going to require us to get messy. Have you ever walked with somebody? Have you ever walked with somebody that wasn't faking and shaking and acting like they had their life together? Have you ever had to get up between the hours of 1 and 3 a.m. to go rescue somebody or go pray for somebody or go pick up somebody's car? And so what Paul is trying to communicate here to Titus is that these relationships are going to produce authentic relationships because you're going to get to know somebody in a way where everything becomes honest and where vulnerability flourishes. I would say this, as disciples of Christ, we should have authentic relationships. If you were to do a quick survey of how many authentic relationships th that you have, would you get past one hand? Some of, you guys, some of you guys might be like me, and my justification and excuse is I keep my circle small. Jesus had 12, then he had three, right? But I want to encourage you to have 12, to have 72, to be able to be that person um, that can be available for people who need you. Yeah, amen. Um, back on up to verse 9. I got excited and lost my place. And so Paul is exhorting... Uh, Titus to teach the slaves to be obedient to their masters, which is a, a real touchy sub subject, especially today. Um, and, and what we have to realize is in biblical times and in the Roman world that slaves was everywhere. Slaves was everywhere, just like employees are everywhere today. And, and um, It was their jobs to reflect the goodness of God to their master, which is the hardest thing we should ever have to do. Sorry, scratch that. It's the hardest thing that we ever will do. To be obedient and loving to someone who doesn't care. Come on. Y'all gonna have to wake up. I'm gonna try this side of the room. <laughs> to be obedient and loving to someone who doesn't care story. There's a story. There's this church lady. Go to church. Every time church doors are open, uh, Tuesday, she's there. Wednesday, she's there. She, uh, uh, Sunday, she's there. And, and so this lady was a believer and her husband was an unbeliever. And so every time this lady went to church, her husband locked her out. He locked her out the house. She had to sleep on the porch until the next day. Every time she woke up and got ready to go back in the house, this is what she would do. <laughs> Baby, can I come in and make you breakfast? Why are you looking at me like that, Maria? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. And so the moral of the story is this. That kept happening for years, and she kept displaying what a godly wife looks like. And then at one point, her husband gets saved after she's been mistreated, used, and abused, locked out of her own home. She still chose to be obedient to the gospel. And so when I think of slaves and harsh treatment and entitlement and all that other stuff that we as believers like to come up with, um, I think of this lady. And when I think of that story, it ministers to me about I signed up to die. I did. God didn't make me. He didn't force me. He didn't trick me. I signed up to die. I signed up to pick up my cross 
every single day and to deny my flesh and deny my ways so that he may be elevated. I did it. Nobody forged my signature, nothing. Therefore, it's my responsibility to give the Holy Spirit permission to minister to me and speak to me when I want to be entitled. Talk to me like that. Treat me like that. Don't you know who I? That's where we mess up, right? Because it's not about us. And it's in those times when we're receptive to what God is doing and we say, ouch, is where our sound doctrine is developed, where we become healthy, wholesome believers that display and demonstrate the words of the scripture by the way that we live. Back to relationships. I can't pass up on this list. I work too hard at it. And so we have a lot of unhealthy relationships. Um, and my question to you is this. Have you ever been in a relationship with someone who's out of control, addicted, disrespectful, greedy, a conspiracy theorist according to scripture, spiteful, always in a hurry, always talking about people? Always tipsy, that means they've been drinking. Translation, right? Always showing someone how to do something the wrong way. Man, I grew up with people like that. Someone who tolerates their spouse. Someone who can't stand their kids. Someone who's flamboyant because it's their right. Somebody that's loose. Have you ever walked into a house and said, man, this house is a wreck? I mean, dirty, unclean, unkept. Do you know anyone that's evil? Do you know someone who's married that don't listen to their spouse? Do you know anyone who makes the word of God look worthless? We all know somebody like that. And if you are sober and in tune with God's spirit this morning, you won't have to look too far to find this person. And so as we continue to do relationships with people that uh, produce authentic um, bonds, we have to understand this, that there's a, a learning and teaching process and it takes time. But as I got some educators in the room, right? There's these concepts that we teach and it's just not going to be overnight. It took me forever to learn that one plus one make two. I, mean, I just wanted to see if y'all's awake. <laughs> and so it takes time for people to learn. And the question is, are you willing to walk with people as they go through their process and learn? Never forget, this brother loves the Lord. I know this brother that loves the Lord and his wife loves the Lord, but this brother's caught up in addiction and this brother done failed so many times. I, I can't believe he still got legs to stand back up. I mean, relapse after relapse, relapse after relapse. His relapse have kids and cousins. The brother just always relapsing and his wife loves the Lord, and naturally, like a woman, she's taking care of the household, and, but she's also trying to seek wise counsel. And I know there, there came a time in his relapse, he relapsed so many times, and I hate counseling this way, but the truth is the truth. And I had to tell the sister that, hey, if you need to leave him, you may want to consider leaving him. And the sister would say, man, no, I love him. I know he loves the Lord and, and the word and this and that. And then he'll relapse 20 more times, literally. 20 more times. Everybody's saying, girl, you need to leave him. Said, no, he loved the Lord. I seen that brother eight months ago doing extremely well. Working, sober taking care of his kids, being the man of God in his household. And by his wife's fidelity and faithfulness, it ministers to me in a way that teaches me this principle of the power of authentic relationships and, 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 the, tenac and the tenacity that, tenacity that it takes to stay in the fight with the people that we love. 
Now, that doesn't give people license or permission to use and abuse you. I'm not saying that at all. And sometimes we may have to take a couple steps back. But what I am saying is this, that to do the things of God and to teach the things of God, it's going to take time for people to learn. It's going to take time for people to learn. Matter of fact, if we were to be honest, we would say that it took time for us to learn. And so here's my question to you. Who are you authentically going through your discipleship process with? Grace-informed discipleship gives others permission to prune you. Ooh, ain't God so good? I just sit back sometimes and I laugh when I think about God. One, I signed up to not have my way. Two, the only way that I'm going to grow is if I get cut. But it's in those times where things don't go right that God is producing something in us. Last point I want to look at today is grace-informed discipleship that persuades sacrificial living. And we're going to jump back up to verses 7 and 8. And it says this, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you. And so young Titus, just like young Timothy, is uh, on this island of Crete, and these people are caught up. And, 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 and God is using Paul to instruct Titus to be an example. Hear me when I say this. If it's hard for you to memorize scripture, if it's hard for you to pray, if it's hard for you to pray out loud, if it's hard for you to fast, if it's hard for you to do the things of God, get this. Start here. Be, be a good example. Be a good example. I didn't say act like you're a good example. I said be a good example, meaning this, that I give God's, permit, or I give God's spirit permission to check me. And then I obey when his, when his spirit says, you out, of, you out of whack, you out of order, you out of line. And then I get in line with what I know his spirit is calling me to be, not act, right? We've seen in Matthew 23 what happens when we act. And so in verse 7, uh, back, back up to verse 7, Paul's telling Titus to be a pattern of good works in all things, and so check this out. The reason why some of y'all feel like nobody's listening to you, because you got a pattern problem. Humor me. Nudge your neighbor and say, do you have a pattern problem? Do you have a pattern problem? Do you? Shoot, I know I got a pattern problem. My patterns is messed up, right? And so some of us have these these pattern problems where consistency is missing. Um, and what I want us to look at is the Greek word, the Greek word for the word pattern, it's tuptu, T-U-P-T-O. And it means to repeatedly thump with a cudgel, which is a small stick, kind of like a police baton, but before they came out, the ones that the cavemen used to use. And, and it means that you just repeatedly thump to punish or offend something. The pattern of our life should repeatedly thump the lie that the devil's been telling us. You ain't going to, you just like your mama. You ain't never going to be none. You just like your daddy. Nobody wants you. You are what happened to you. You are your emotions. You are your feelings. But Jesus is saying, Paul's using, uh, the Lord's using Paul to say in this letter that our lives need to become this pattern. Where I'm living in a way that is stumping this lie, in a way that's stumping this plan of the enemy, in a way that's stumping my flesh, in a way that allows me to get in line with the things of God so that my example may allow the gospel to be attractive. Don't nobody want to follow anyone or anything 
that is dusted, broke down, and disgusted. At least I don't. And so that's this Greek word for the word pattern. And so that's what Paul, or that's what Titus is being instructed to do, to live this way. As a preacher on this island where people are always lying, where people are evil, evil and where people are greedy. Which means that things aren't going to go his way. Which means there are going to be some tension and how he teaches and how he lives out his life. And so the question is this, what's preventing the pattern of your life to thump the lie and the plan of the enemy out of it? In verse seven, Titus is instructed in teaching and doctrine to show integrity, reverence, and corruptibility. And so in chapter two, we see all types of doctrine. We see atonement, we see salvation, redemption, sanctification, and all of these doctrines are important, but I want to concentrate and elevate the doctrine of salvation as it relates to chapter one in Titus and the people that's rebellious, that's caught up in myths and genealogies and all this weird stuff, they're caught up in circumcision. And they're basically communicating this idea of if you're not snip snip, then you ain't saved. If you don't keep the Jewish law, then you ain't saved. It's always Jesus plus. Jesus if. Jesus is enough by himself. And so it's important for Titus to be able to help the people of Crete to put on their helmet of salvation so that when those lies begin to circle and, and to permeate their minds, that they could stand on the gospel of grace and the good news in Jesus Christ. And so Paul pins it like this in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight, nine. He says, for by grace, for by circumcision, or by the law, for by works. Hold on, let me see if I can make this fit. For by being a good person, man. For by wearing Ralph Lauren. For by wearing Chanel. Hold on, I, I got something. I got something. For by following the universe. Wrong answer. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's by God's ocean of unmerited love, unmerited favor that we are saved by grace. I want to put a thumbtack in there real quick and unpack this idea. And so as we think about grace and we look at the Old Testament, we could look at the garden. What happened in the garden? Adam and Eve messed up. They get kicked out. They try to cover themselves with a leaf that's going to wither. Then the grace of God comes in, even though you got to go. And this may be ministering to some of y'all about some people. Even though you got to go, let me give you a little something, something that's going to sustain you as he wraps them in animal clothing. Or as I think about the grace of God, I could think about how um, in Genesis 6 and 7, the ways of the world was just evil and wicked, and men did what was right in their own eyes. So God said, y'all got to go. All y'all. Man, that's how I know God got a little something, something. All y'all got to go. I'm about to kill y'all. Y'all about to die, right? But the grace of God starts a new beginning with the biblical number of eight, the, the, the amount of people that comes out of the boat and preserves this family by his grace. And hold on. Let's, get, let's, let's, let's flirt with the text a little bit. You got me on this boat with all these animals and all my people and all their droppings, and I still survive? Praise God. I know some people that can't survive by some gases that get released next to them. As I think about the grace of God, <laughs> I think about Meshach, Shadrach, and a bad Negro, I mean Abednego, <laughs> in the fiery furnace. They come out not even smelling like smoke. They come out 
That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. But then as we transition and step over into the New Testament, all we got to do is say this one word to experience the grace of God. Jesus. 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 The full embodiment of grace and truth. Let me give this free nugget to somebody and then we'll keep on moving and wrap this up. Jesus, book of, book of John, I believe, uh, verse 14, talks about that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Some of y'all have been letting people run over you, take advantage of you, misuse you and abuse you because you're a believer. I gotta show grace. Don't forget, we can't put God in a box. He's not just this, he's God, which means he's this and that. Say that again. He's this and that. And so Jesus is full of grace and truth. And what he calls us and empowers us to be is full of grace and truth. Meaning sometimes we may have to tell somebody, no, but I still love you. I can't do it, but I still love you. You was wrong, but I still forgive you. This is your fifth strike. You got to go, but I still love you. And it got to be more than lip service because God is calling us to be full of grace and truth. And so to finish out Ephesians 2, 8, I'm sorry, John, um, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Like I said, we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. Titus must keep everything focused on God in Christ. We must keep everything focused on God in Christ. And so he goes on verse 8 to say that um, Titus must have sound speech that cannot be condemned, that <clears throat> one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. I like to call this the eight mile principle. Be rabbit, Papa Doc. Oh, let me see. This is how I know who's been saved a long time and, <laughs> and, and who's kind of new. B Rabbit and Papa Doc, two characters in the movie called Eight Mile. And, and, and in this movie, um, the, the rapper Eminem was from a trailer park, grew up poor, didn't have nothing, but he was trying to rap. He was a Caucasian brother um, um, aspiring to get into uh, African-American uh, sport. And it was easy for African-Americans to downplay him based on his race. And so what he does in the finale is he goes and he just talks about himself in a way that his opponent couldn't say nothing. Just dropped the mic and left. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is this. God is calling us to live in a way, to teach in a way that is healthy and sound with no loopholes. That way, when people want to fix their lips to say that ain't God, they, all they can say is th they don't have nothing to say. They don't have nothing to say. And if you've been living long enough, you'll pick up on this principle. When you treat people good and like people and you love them, people are very considerate of that when they reply to things that are hard. And so my encouragement to you guys this morning is to adopt this eight mile principle um, in a way that uh, um, is incorruptible, um, and in a way that our, our testimony, uh, we communicate in a way that is incorruptible and in a way that leaves no room to take away from our testimony. And so I was at the YMCA swimming with my wife and my son the other day, and uh, God moved, put it on my heart to bless this young man. And uh, as I was going to bless this young man, um, I was like, dang, why am I scared? A grown man, a minister of the gospel, sent to preach, sent to teach, sent to pray, sent to help, sent to serve. And I was just kind of got nervous to evangelize this little kid in the pool. And so after I got past my fear, I went up to the little kid and I said, man, I said, do you know a man by the name of Jesus? <laughs> he said, uh, I don't believe in that stuff. I said, ah. Oh. 
And so the challenge for me was this. In my mind, I'm like, man, this is easy. This is a layup. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to bless this kid, and I'm going to give him the gospel all at the same time. Check. And this little dude straight up said, I don't believe in all that stuff. I said, well, he believes in you. Here you go. Oh, thank you. 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 And then I was leaving. And uh, my personality is to push, 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 push. I needed to stop on the, the first push. Push, push, push. And so as I was leaving, I wanted to give him a little bit more because he made me feel a certain type of way when he said, I don't believe in all that stuff. Um, but the Holy Spirit said, just leave it. Let it be. Love him. Be a pattern. Be an example on what you know. And I just, hey, bye, man. And this kid, like, almost hugged me and tackled me back in the pool to thank me for the blessing that God used me to give him. But that comes from the sound teaching of the word of God, highlighted, amplified by the spirit of God. And so in closing, I just want to hit us with a couple application steps and I'll be out your way. So once again, in review, grace-informed discipleship promotes sound doctrine. Grace-informed discipleship requires your lips and your life to line up with God's word. If what you live in ain't lined up with what you speak in, that's a gauge or a barometer to tell you that we need to make adjustments. Second, grace-informed discipleship produces authentic relationships. Authentic relationships are designed to increase your pain tolerance. What kind of pain tolerance do you have for yourself, for your spouse, for your kids, for your coworkers? Pain tolerance. I mean, how much pain can your soul takes before you start acting like you ain't a believer? That's what I'm saying. How much can you take? But I want you to know this, those authentic relationships that rub you the wrong way are designed to increase that. And last but not least, grace-informed discipleship that persuade sacrificial living um, is just simple spiritual equation. Information plus application equals transformation. But sometimes we just have information, no transformation. Sometimes we have, we act, and we have application, it appears, but we'll have no information and no transformation. God is saying, what's in my word? The leaders that I entrusted and put over you to teach you, through your prayer life, I need you to gain and obtain that knowledge and then apply it. Not just grab the knowledge so that you know and that you're quoting these Million dollar words, I got 20 letters in them to show how much of a theologian you are. But God is saying you need to grab this knowledge of his word that's eternal and you need to apply it to your life so that it equal transformation. But but the equal just ain't that easy. And so in that equal sign, I see this. That prevents us from being transformed because a lot of us have information. A lot of us have application, but there's not been no transformation in years. Why not? Because in that equal sign, I see this. I see deception. Easily deceived. I see entitlement. God, you should be here in my prayers. Don't you know how much I give? Don't you know how much I volunteer? Don't you know how much I serve? Anytime they need anybody, I'm always there. Y'all hear my prayers? Why am I going through this? And then last but not least, I see pride. So I just want to encourage you with this. As we unpack this idea of um, uh, a grace community church, walking through the book of Titus, some of you guys haven't been reading your Bibles. I'm not con condemning you. Um, some of you guys have been in a season where it's been dull at a standstill for months. And so I would encourage you to do this. As we're unpacking this idea um, throughout the book of Titus, I encourage you to get in there. Study it out for yourself. Walk through the book with us as we're walking through it. Allow the teaching and your private intimacy. Intimate, God, can I talk today? 
I done had too much coffee, not enough water. Sorry. Um, your time of intimacy with God uh, be a supplement to what he's doing. And that's how it works. You hear one thing, and then you read one thing, then his spirit amplifies it. You're like, oh, and when you live it out. And so I just encourage you to walk through the book of Titus with us um, throughout the week um, to add to your process. Let's pray.